Congratulations. that we currently engage in and the status quo is a form of politics that's underlined by a dangerous form of good faith. That is, that is to say, the politics as a way of thinking that does not recognize the inherent inertia that's been embedded in individuals' way of thinking due to their social class, for example, due to the fact that they're not willing to sacrifice their own conveniences right now to recognize the structural destruction that's going to be happening around them and the shortchanging of certain particular members of society that are currently disenfranchised, right? We're saying that when in truth the system is working against these particular individuals, it's time for us to recognize that the most important way or the most rewarding way for us to be able to conduct these kinds of class politics is to engage in class warfare, to say that these are the enemy and we are the alliance that we need to participate in in order for us to create and manifest any real change in society, right? We say that the current politics of reconciliation is particularly problematic when the breadth of society that is most populous and have the most the rest from a loss of their interests are the poor and the marginalized, the people who are living in paycheck to paycheck, no thank you, that have their, their particular concerns cheapened by people telling them that they are being too demanding in the status quo. They are actually damaging the progress of their particular movement, or their particular politics by being too, uh, by, by being too, uh, by, like, by calling out these particular establishments, right? We prefer instead to add a vehicle to their righteous anger, ladies and gentlemen, and to use that as a political beat stick to beat the establishment into submission. That is what we're stand for under our side of the house. What do we imagine the politics of class warfare to look like, right? We think that most likely it's going to involve things like targeting and villainizing another class. If the rich and the privileged will happily concede to that, for example, you start with a political establishment that's not willing to give any concessions to people who are desperate for survival, for example, we think that we're going to, uh, we're going to like, tell them that they're getting fat in their silver spoons, and that's not just the fact that we need to redistribute that to the rest of society. We think that also involves class solidarity between people of our particular backgrounds, for example, that we have been given the short end of the thing, and it's righteous for us to be able to express this anger the only way that we know how. We think that's going to be emotionally cathartic and emotionally resonant towards the entirety of society, right? We didn't compare to what you have on your rear side of the house are things like reaching marginal change. Like when you look at Kamala Harris and Biden's piecemeal progressive policies, for example, that does not actually create any structural change, but only gives like a 
small tax cut to the middle class, for example, we think that that is the kind of policy that's going to be sustained our years back in the past. We think that they're also going to vilify radical change as well, and they're going to tell them that these are the, exactly what's wrong with our particular movement back on that, and you are the particular reasons that people like you are suffering at this particular moment. We think that that is unjustifiable, right? Who sets on this in my speech? Firstly, when the politics of class warfare is more likely to create structural change, and secondly, when we need to become the vehicle of righteous anger to these people, right? We feel, right? So firstly, why the politics of class warfare is more likely to create structural change. You can recognize that the people on the short end of the stick have to count their strengths and they have to count their blessings. The, that's to say, pardon me, uh, the only strength that we have as a particular member of society are the fact that we are populist in numbers, but also that we are morally unconflicted. Unlike, for example, rich liberals who have to lose if they want to support like redistributive policies, for example, we, we think that we are morally unconflicted in the sense that we want this redistribution and we know that we're in the right at the end of the day, right? We think that's how you get, we think that's, that, that's how you give rise to incredibly powerful movements like Black Lives Matter, for example, like Pride, after Stonewall, that can pierce taboos and break glass ceilings because there are so many of us, for example, who are fully committed to our cause, we know that we're on the right side, and we know that we are the ones who are supposed to be catered to, right? We think that class warfare solidifies that because you're more likely to dominate numbers because you speak to your particular way of preaching speaks to the particular anger that they feel, for example, when they when they look back on the experiences that they experience as a minority, they are more likely to resonate with the messages that you're saying, for example, you also you, you affirm that their suffering is something that's legitimate rather than something that needs to be put on the back burner as you will have or their side of the house. Right? And the comparative reconciliation uh, damages that because you're telling these people that you need to manage your anger better, ladies and gentlemen. You need to make sure that that's dull in order for in order for people to be able to relate to it. We don't think that that is something that's strategic. You have to concede to the oppressors that are oppressing you. They're actually good people, ladies and gentlemen. Who want the best for you, but it's you that's not uh, that's not responding to their goodwill at the end of the day. We think that that is unpersuasive for people to want to join the movement at the end of the day, right? But assuming that we fail in our movement scenario, for example, say we overshoot in our demands, we say that that is something that's perfectly fine because we're more likely to get good policies as a compromise. We overshoot the demand and we don't like manage that anger at the end of the day, right? Because, for example, if you have a Green New Deal and something that's very ambitious in the status quo, we think Democrat establishment is already adopting pieces of it, so in this in the case that Green New Deal uh, does not, uh, does not uh, like, does not come into being, we think that there are still more marginal changes that we're able to derive from that. Right? The comparative of of the house is the feminism, that you don't introduce ideas, because to begin with, you are too radical, for example, and we think that that's something that's bad. But secondly, even if the, uh, but secondly, we think that we also are better and able to governance participation in terms of movement turnout, for example, in terms of the donations that flow into our movement, we think that that is something that is particularly good for us to maintain. Second subject, regarding why this is a vehicle of righteous anger that needs to be maintained, right? I think it's important to recognize that the marginalized have a lot of righteous anger that they currently feel. When Bezos, for example, is making his company billion while others struggle to feed their children, we think that that is something that we should righteous. We have to feel angry, but the truly people are people out there and they're not willing to recognize our struggles in comparison to their conveniences. And we think it's something that you have to recognize, right? And you have the right to be angry about, uh, about that when people refuse to sympathize Sir? with their condition out of convenience. So thank you. I think that political platforms have to recognize that anger as legitimate. Because first and foremost, that is something that's incredibly liberating and cathartic to the vast majority of society. To have someone who is established within the system recognize your struggles and be willing to fight for that, irrespective of how that fight turns out, just to know that there is that hope at the end of that something that's already liberating for you at the end of the day to have your concerns be legitimized in such a manner, right? And they compare that at best, what opposition is promoting is apologism. That, and that, for example, you you want changes to happen, but you also need to undercut it in, this, in the sense that the politicians will not be able to materialize it if you are not if, if you are not uh, if you are not radical in the way that they try to pers uh, pursue them. Right? But at worst, what they have is vilification that they're destructive to the progress you said, and that you're trying to and that your efforts is actually backfiring from people who are of similar backgrounds and that's something that's incredibly hurtful for these people, right? I think this is important because politics is not only about actual change, but the hope at the end of the child to feel like change might happen in the future, ladies and gentlemen. We think that we need to have a uh, meaning to your fight when you when you continuously go out to march sacrificing like your daily pay, for example, in order for you to, be, to have that uh, ownership within the movement, that's something that is inherently beneficial for you. Right? And we say that we drop that. This is particularly important in the case when this when, when we're talking about the disenfranchised, right? To no longer uh, to have been disenfranchised so up in the system, to no longer have to ignore the call of a march that's erupting underneath your feet, ladies and gentlemen, which is something is particularly important for that for these particular people. So I think that's, that's what we drop them when we we have run like quite the righteous and that's why we're very proud to open the debate.
Prime Minister for his speech and the Bank Leader of Opposition to introduce the case from Sino Pima. Go, go. Could, 
and extend, could extend and pursue the concession. But secondly, on how in our side would create uh, create a diversity in the political progress and how and, and how the political diversity is better in our side of the house, ladies and gentlemen. So first, on how the discussion would be even worse in the side of the house, ladies and gentlemen. In the side of the house. It's, it's more likely one side interest, ladies and gentlemen. It, also, it is harmful because always detrimental to the other politics without any process of evaluation. Because we have to understand the characterization of this kind of class welfare only focus to, to the certain interest of people, but secondly, always going to become the opposition at the end of the day. Why we do not like that? Because at the end of the at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the process of discussion and the quality of discussion discussion only focus to their own interest and also avoid and also dismissive dismiss towards to any kinds of interest, especially from the interest of minority, ladies and gentlemen. It is harmful for democracy because they always prioritize the powerful people, for example, white people, rich people, and they have no way to protect minority at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen. But even if in the in, in their politics it would be effective because it's based on one quarter base, we say that it's not about the actors' debate, ladies and gentlemen. This this is this debate is about how the evaluate the process of evaluation would be better. So that is why that whether or not the people would get harmed and detrimental by their system, ladies and gentlemen. So the benefit in the side of the house only exists for majority and so on and so forth. So what do we want in our world? Yeah. No, thank you. Because the process of evaluation and discussion would even be, it would even better in our side, ladies and gentlemen. And it's more safer in our side because the people or the politics might not diminish other people, might not diminish to towards to other politics, ladies and gentlemen. So example in the past that we are uh, more likely to be radical left, but right now we are more centrist, for example. That is why this is showing you the dynamics of political system would better in our side and better to create policies that which are better to the people at the end of the day. Second point is about how uh, by create this kind of, uh, by stay in this kind of political reconciliation would create a diversity in political progress. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to understand that these kinds of class welfare on, do not, uh, they don't want to be compromised at the end of the day. They will always fit into their own interests and stay to their own interests, ladies and gentlemen. So I will explain to you why in the process of politics, it's important to be compromised. Because it's necessary, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because we are always need to adapt with our policies, adapt with uh, uh, what happened in status quo towards to our citizens, for example. This is important because in the government side, government unable to adapt with a certain policies because they keep consistent in their own interest, ladies and gentlemen. So what is the outcome in opening opposition? In their side, more likely to central of power, they will be central of power, ladies and gentlemen. And it would, it would become more bigger. Comparative in our side, we appreciate any form of diversity, diverse values, and diverse opinions towards to other, pe to, towards to other people. That's why we believe that Kun has bring the trophy home. Thank you.
house. Opening opposition chose to choose the urgency of better ideas and more diversity of ideas. Mainly, their problem with our case of political class warfare is to say that we will make the ideologies of the minorities or the interests of the minorities die out because we will galvanize the majority. I find this idea really, really weird given that class warfare will rely on the most vulnerable people and the largest amount, uh, the, the largest class in the political landscape, which is most likely the poor to middle class, right? And it's not highly unlikely to the middle upper class to the upper class. So we think that the case of opening opposition is dead on arrival just because it's very much unrealistic in how it will play out in real life. I'll talk about two things in my speech. Firstly, I'll talk, about, uh, I'll talk about who's more likely in this case to create better policy making. Secondly, I'll talk about who's more likely to create better participation by the people in politics, right? So, firstly, who's more likely to create better policy making? I have told you a really important idea, that we have currently a problem in which the politics of reconciliation creates piecemeal policies, right? I'll extend this a bit. The reason why this is the case is because under the politics of reconciliation, you do politicians do two things. One, they consider the other side too much that makes you uh, that makes them have very easy concessions to the other side, right? That's why most likely you get half baked policies like Obamacare, but also that politicians are on their side too excited to get their policies done as a uh, as as a show of political success. We think that this is really, really bad because then they will see things that are not beneficial to your target, like getting people actually insured in more healthcare, like uh, and, uh, appeasing pri uh, to private corporations. That is not a good strategy, right? To actually get the target of giving people the welfare that they need. The comparative on our side is you set the bar at a, at a much higher pace, right? That you need to make structural changes in the things that you want uh, in the things that you want to change to actually achieve your goal. So you don't make easy concessions, but the concessions, the concessions that you do make in the future actually matter because it gives you the structural change you need. This is like. Uh, currently, the American Congress voting for criminal uh, criminal reform and having uh, concessions at tax cuts, which is okay because at least in the criminal reform part, you actually help the vulnerable black people that are in prison because of unjustified drug charges. Before I move on, closing. You realize that people, uh, if you are seen as asking too much, why won't your issues as radicalists might be going to be retaliated yes. even more? Okay, so this is going to be generally the line of opening uh, opening opposition and basically closing opposition, right? There's going to be a deadlock, you're going to fire up the other base. Firstly, to respond to that POI, you're unlikely to fire up the other base since the other base is the middle upper class that will not increase in any, in any type of power, right? Their only power is giving money. So, in a comparative on our side is when we have much more people demanding much more things, it's highly likely that politicians are going to be much more responsive to the more malleable, the, uh, the more malleable, malleable voter base that can actually increase in power rather than just giving money on their side. But secondly, I think that on this point about deadlock, what the opening opposition also talked about, right? It's unlikely to happen because on our side, it's likely that conservatives or people who are much less genuine would be much less popular because you expose, you make politicians able in doing uh, campaigns that attacks the identity of these bad politicians, right? Exposing their voting records, actually like, taking a look at where they, their money, or money for uh, 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 their money comes from, like from lobbying groups that are not interested in, the, in benefiting the classes that they uh, that they claim to defend in the very first place, right? So this is why you go, you don't get that wrong because the other side is just much less powerful. But secondly, the comparative in the worst case on our side is that we actually stop bills that are destructive to people's lives, right? If you only make concessions for concession's sake, you don't actually stop these bills. You just adopt uh, parts of these bills or you let parts of these bills that are actually destructive to your class because you want the interest of passing your own policies and that is really bad, right? But the last thing that opening opposition talked about in this, uh, 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 in this issue is to say that, oh, on our side, there will be no exploration of ideas, so when ideas don't work, 
uh, things will basically go to shit because we're just that uh, uh, that inflexible, right? No, that's not true. Because even when we are in class warfare, we have a goal in benefiting a certain class. So let's say that we're in a class warfare for benefiting the blue collar class. It's likely that we will constantly evaluate the policies and if it actually is beneficial for the blue collar workers, right? So it's unlikely that we'll repeat the mistakes all the time just because we are not able, uh, just because we're, that, uh, we're doing class warfare. It's likely that there will be more checks and balances coming from the more energized voter base, which is the issue that they didn't touch, right? Who's more likely to create better participation? And this is very important because uh, because without participation, right, you're not able to create check and balances in the government or create any meaningful change. They haven't told you why on their side specifically, using the politics of reconciliation is likely to protect the most vulnerable people. We tell you that through participation, that it would. We told you that on our side, people are much more likely to be fully committed to our cause because their anger is not uh, is not delegitimized. But this is not only a psychological benefit, right? It's also a check and balance mechanism towards the politicians that are representing these people. Because when you are angry and your anger is not uh, and your anger is legitimized, it's much more likely for you to voice out concerns as to the impact of the policies that the politicians that represents you, uh, 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 sorry, as to the harms of the, uh, that comes from the impact of the policies that your politi that uh, your politicians have voted for, right? That means that if for the party itself or for the politicians that claim to protect the vulnerable people, it's much more likely that they're going to be much uh, that they're going to be responsive and going to change the policies or modify the policies in the future. The comparative on their side is these people will always be seen as people who are destructive to the political standing of these politicians. So they will look for other voter bases, look for the center, right? That's why they will abandon the policies that actually benefit these people and try to move closer to the middle or higher class, right? That's when it's really, really bad for those who are poor, for those who are actually need help. And that's why we're very proud of the vote. <laughs> I think OG failed this debate because their only argumentation in which why policy, radical policies are going to be accepted is because that flops won't happen because other majorities or other people doesn't have power to reject that. I think this dismissed in the majority of most political conditions in most countries are facing in which there is always opposition that are able to have a different policies and always try to reject your policies. I think almost every country has this. So do you, I think this also means all of your benefits cannot fly because of this inability to explain why the radical forces are going to accept that. But for going to my argument, several direct rebuttals. One, they say that marginal policies happen in our side. I think this dismisses entirely our context. I think in the current status quo, the politics of reconciliation doesn't mean that you always accept destructive policies. In the current status quo, you can always say of that. Other policies are not good, but saying that it's maybe their goodwill. So I think the current status quo, the discussion about the effectivity, is just doesn't mean it doesn't happen in our side. So I think our opposition that happens and exists in our side will not mean that instantaneously going to be stupid and accept destructive policies for their own political uh, constituents, ladies and gentlemen. But secondly, I think in a comparative, having marginal policies is much better rather than having no policies at all in their side. Because by having marginal policies, 
A means that at least you can appease several people in Granstado School, at least your constituents, but B, you can have temporary change. Because in the Granstado School, most likely the our ability to grow is having first temporary change and have collective and maybe several years that can make your policies to be better in the future. But then the second argument is this. They can galvanize more members and can collectivize more members. I think first response is it is entirely very, very inexclusive. Because in our side, we can still galvanize members by maybe saying good socialization, better ability to appeal towards individuals by saying that in the current status quo, the discussion about policies and discussion of politics is actually not toxic anymore because somehow we can compromise to certain situations, thus making discussion to be much better, which my elbow explain in our argument. But secondly, they are talking about why this will uh, create a better liberating because you empower more individuals and empower individuals to engage more in participation. The last argument of EPM. I think, ladies and gentlemen, that participation means that you have the capability to engage to how people react in the current status quo, in which I think is my first argument. Because I think the opening government are able to explain the characterization of how in different worlds this will affect people, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, notice the politics of warfare, why it's going to harm, uh, harm uh, badly on how people perceive politics. Because in the current status quo, they will see that everything that happens is politics is always oppositional and is always demonizing the other members that their policies is always the best. This is harmful. Because notice that in almost all contexts, this, policies change in different situations and sometimes politicians need to change their stances. I think this is going to harm the individual's ability to engage in politics because they see that there may be the ideology of the politics, politicians that they support in the past are unable to hear towards the differences and the changes of politi policies that are happening in the current status quo. In comparison, ladies and gentlemen, in our side, they can adapt more because their ability to engage in much more dis uh, coherent discussions are better going to be able to make them to be having uh, good uh, policies discussions. But secondly, Notice, notice that the direct characterizations of uh, class warfare, ladies and gentlemen, is how you always think that you are the best. How does this implement in the real world situation, ladies and gentlemen? It is, you always make an A minus towards the pol your policies of other members, ladies and gentlemen. So, what, how does this look? It looks like you are always making lingos that are bad towards your opposition, and you always make a social narrative that your uh, opponent is always very, very bad towards your opponents. This is very bad because it's making discussion to be very toxic to the extent where you are never evaluating policies but always saying that the others are is all hap is Point. always bad, but not saying Point. why is your policies actually effective in the long run. In comparison, in our side, the politics of goodwill makes you able to holistically evaluate the policies more because you are not always saying a minus, but always trying to recharacterize and always re-identify what is the the uh, uh, the last uh, the lacks of your policies. So I think this harms this battle, uh, this ability to attack people, you're actually able to uh, tackle the argument of participation. But before second argument, uh, closing. Politics of class conflict does not mean that these people are just radical, never compromise the angry people, because you know, they have to reason to why their interests are justified. They have to pass the deal in a party. Why that calculation is true? Yeah, they are only going to reason towards their own political uh, supporters. They're not going to reason to maybe the other policies that might be affected in that sense. So I think what does this mean? That in that opening government world, they're always trying to reject the, all of the other policies that might be beneficial for them. Such as in how Obamacare are actually beneficial towards all people and how it is successful in trying to uh, give benefits towards people. Right? But they can't just say that there is the possibility for you just to continuously engage to all people. Because just like what the info slide, info slide say, class warfare means that you have no capability to bridge discussion and bridge compromise. So I think it's a fear of definition there. But secondly, ladies and gentlemen, why this creates, uh, why this creates the incapability to actually create uh, uh, policies and the capability to actually give people options? I think, ladies and gentlemen, the most important thing to take from opening opposition is A, you have cap better capability to create policies. Why? Because notice that in the current status quo, to create policies, you are not able to only just cater to certain people. You all always have to cater to a large voter base and a large uh, and largely pandering to so much people. I think this is much better in our side. How? Because in the process, 
you are going to say and acknowledge that maybe in some circumstances and in some situations you are able to tackle these kinds of problems, such as how Obama can succeed, because they can see that these kinds of policies is actually maybe the betterment also towards the Republican man. And in their side, Obamacare are not going to happen and they're not always going to benefit these kind of people that are suffering in the current status quo. But secondly, ladies and gentlemen, how it also is the capability of people to engage to more diverse options. Because notice that in the current status quo, the moment class warfare happens, it is only going to engage towards the people that are majority. Sure, you see maybe there are a very good large amount of people that are actually minority, but this is, hasn't happened in the majority. Where they control discussions, they control narratives, and they control politicians that have money and capital that funds the campaigns, that funds all these policies that happen. So I think probably these kinds of things are not going to engage towards them because their ability to be able to fit in towards the definition of these kinds of uh, politicians are not going to exist. Ladies and gentlemen, I think opening option wins and the probability to gain better, uh, better policies thus tackling open government for for all. Wrong, so discussions in the fundamental of their past. 
But even if discussion happens, do you think the best that's going to end changes? The disproportionately end changes the asymmetry that happens there in the past. Why? Because even, for example, radical opinions, racist opinions, get this excuse, or like they get this bill that your opinion is actually, is actually correct and is something that is legitimate. Because now we have this political realism that says that every political opinion is equally legitimate. But how does this happen? How does this work on the ground? First of all, it can those extreme political parties. For example, overtone windows that already happen in the rest of the past. People are more likely to stick to their own ideology. People like likely to be stick on the other, for example, equal gender is more likely to be happen on their side. Because now this, we have this narrative that everyone's opinion is correct, so people are more like, people would want to stick to their own ideology. And also even, for example, racist ideology are going to get this shield or like guard that their opinion is actually something that is correct, which gives it like dangerous, legitimate political platform for those kind of people. And even, for example, minority want to call out those kind of people, call out, but actually voice out, because reconciliation is going to use against them because now they are framed as enemy of democracy and that is only, like, extremely problematic. But we think, for example, moreover, what happens to actually minority or, like, vulnerable people's, people's like, mind is that they are forced to vote for the people who are actually not truly representing their opinions. Rather than the, the politicians that truly represent the interests, Seemingly well meaning people or good people, those minority will be for, actually forced to vote for those people on the uh, on their side of the house. <laughs> the conclusion being, on their side of the house, discussion planning doesn't happen. Moreover, but moreover, even if that happens, it happens in a way that is disproportionately privileged the existing privileged individual. A second extension, how what's gonna happen on our side? What exactly is this narrative of class reconciliation cross border those people? We think that we project the narrative that those no concession happens on their side, on our side, only anger happens on our side, because it actually changes the people's mentality. First of all, we have, we actually, for example, change the moderate or center right, center left individual, not like racist or radical individual. But what we talked about is that we talked about how they mobilize more people without necessarily telling us what, how that's going to work on our side. What, what happens on our side is that it requires people to have reason for their own opinions. Because people recognize that people have different interests. So you need to convince people on the other side to actually convince you. So for example, when pe the perception of the perception of the people is going to be thus only someone's opinion is then correct. So people will, will like become more self-accountable in checking what kind of what opinion is actually correct, what kind of opinion is legitimate. Which means that for example, politicians or people will be incentivized to show the reason, for example, statistics or facts, the more reasonable event debate will happen on our side. Yeah. But secondly, it also forces other party to make compromise on our side of house rather because for example if you have for example some party or some politicians starting to talk about the minority, the other it, like forces other like counterparts political party to care for those, for example, women, like Muslim or immigrants on the other side of the house because they actually need to get support. But third of all, it also affects the mentality of minorities. Because not minority has to like have this all, for example, the political politicians, political party that have having meaningful debate to convince actual people on the ground. So actually for the whole vote and uh, vote for the politicians that truly represent their own interests, which actually benefit those people on the ground. Conclusion being, we actually get like have accountability to the opinions of our side of the house. People will get to check more what kind of opinion is actually legitimate, what kind of opinions truly represent their own, own interests, which better benefit the people on the ground. What did I tell you in my speech? First of all, I told you what their apartment really looks like, how it like rather this like disproportionately benefit the privileged individual on their side. But second of all, I told you what our paradigm looks like, how this actually affects the people's mentality and how it better benefit the minority and vulnerable individuals on the ground. How do you take
you all in opposition wants to talk about how there will be variety of diverse forms of policies, us as the closing opposition team will clarify the identity of which we protect. We think that we need to be able to protect minorities from the lower class, exactly because they are powerless and representation is not going to be protected if they and people are actively attacking them in the very first place, right? Therefore, you need to be able to have a strategic approach in which you have you have to be pragmatic and at least have a politics that is in an ideal forms of discourse and compromise can happen, right? We understand that criticism and asymmetry can happen on both sides, but therefore you do need a mechanism that is able to handle it to at least protect these people and create a better fundamental for them, right? We think that in uh, the stance of the op uh, closing opposition is clear. We prefer the politics of reconciliation because we think that the function of politics, which is the basic fulfillment of principle that was never brought up within the debate, exactly about representations of the people, tangible policies that will be created, and check and balance that should happen, is something that should be pushed and something that should be catered towards a very ideal form, at least in terms of protection. Right? So we think that the actors that we're going to protect is exactly everyone, including the minority. But we'll, so but before that, few rebuttals of the speaker that stood here before me, right? So first of all, how they said that there's going to be structural damage and therefore it needs to be fixed, right? Number one, notice that the government team has never really explained to you how they're going to fix it, right? Because if these people are actually attacking each other or they actually hate each other and they have a very fundamental differences, within exactly when you make yourself as someone exclusive, you're going to uh, there's going to be a competition between each of these both sides and they're going to travel each other anyway, right? But second of all, we think that they should be at least in a form of minimal group faith, right? So at least we both teams need to concede that on certain levels, there are politicians who are willing to engage towards each other. Because otherwise, we think that conditions are going to be much worse on their side when it's so much more competitive and when you uh, use very racist lingos or whatsoever to trample down the other side, right? But third of all, we concede that the policies that will be created will be slower or the structural damage will be slower. But we think that at least during that buffer Time, they're still protecting the minorities or the lower classes instead of being troubled over by the top, right? Second rebuttal about how they said that if you do engage on certain discussions, you're going to be considered as someone who demanded too much. Number one, notice that most of the harms or benefits that come up within uh, what they try to bring up to you is very contingent towards the status quo of who is the one that is proposing that policies to the very beginning and who exactly has the upper hand within the parliament or other politics, right? We think that if you analyze the status quo, it's exactly the ones that belongs in an upper level the conservatives, the privileged or whatsoever. They're the one who have the lobbying power. They're the one who can define and have the majority support within their hands, right? So we think that that's exactly showing to you why the progressives aren't necessarily going anywhere within the status quo, and that's not going to happen on their side, right? But second of all, they have said that suddenly you're, it's okay because you have a one goal, you're still going to have talk and negotiations with these people or whatsoever. Number one, we don't think that that is what presidents is within the impulse, right? But second of all, even if you do want to engage on the other side, we think that it's going to be very, uh, very evil, right? Because most likely you're going to lobby the other side. You're going to try to compromise bribe or whatsoever. And we think that in the end of the day, the very value of the minority is exactly something that's unrepresentative and neglected on their side. Other rebuttals will be integrated within my speech. So three things that I'm going to talk about. Number one, representation of needs. Second, tangible policies that will be created because we see that there's no portrayal of what's going to happen. And third of all, the check and balance and why uh, it's not going to be good on their side, right? So one of the first part, representations of needs. You need to understand, in ideal world, we think that people should be able to have their needs voiced out. But what happens in the context of very competition is that you see that there's polarization and different demands or priorities towards different causes, right? So what do they actually do in order to maintain this asymmetry of power? They boycott medias. They make sure that you have no access to voice out within different mediums or platform. They make sure to belittle every single concerns that you have exactly because they want to prioritize their own needs in the very beginning, right? So what does this tell you? It means that exactly because it's a very exclusive, uh, a very exclusive counterpart, they're going to make sure that the other side is not going to be heard of or anyway, right? They want to talk about leverage. That's not going to be happening exactly because the minorities will most likely have less leverage on their side with the numbers of backing that they don't have. But what's going to be different or offside is simple. We think that exactly because you have this effort to reconcile with each other, you're, they're going to have appreciation towards the leverage that you have. They're going to listen to you. Obviously, they're not going to cater towards all the needs that you have, but it's going to be Money. much of a bipartisan policy, right? It means that they're going to talk to a very certain uh, to a certain point of conversation and it can happen. For example, the policies about climate change, right? You see that there are a certain controversies about, for example, trying to uh, increase syntax or whatsoever. But then there's an engagement coming from both sides that says you can't increase it that expensively because some people 
people are still struggling. So we think that these are the discussions that can only happen on our side and not towards theirs, exactly because the people are going to be stubborn and are unwilling to engage towards each other, right? The second one, of tangible policy. Policies, right? We think that the policies that you need to be able to create is exactly the ones that are able to cater towards all people's needs, but at the same time show very minimum harm towards a certain class or towards a certain level in existing, right? It means that you do need engagement and coordination coming from both parties or from opposing parties. In the status quo, policies that was uh, in the status quo on their side, the policies that are going to be made or actions that are going to be made is exactly going to be very extreme. Exactly because you no longer have to cater towards the other layers of classes. It's simply because we only want to prioritize towards the white people, for example, most of the time they're going to prior they're going to make things uh, policies that are only benefiting towards them. We think that while they are also pushing for the policies to make people agree with it, they're going to use very uh, evil justification of lingos that may harm or impact towards certain people. For example, for the Dakota pipeline, it's easy for the privileged to try to push for that policy, but at the same time use the racist lingo towards the Native Americans, saying that the reason why they don't want the Dakota pipeline is because you hate the white people and they want us to be poor forever, right? We think that in comparison, in terms of reconciliation, you're going to be able to gather in the same table. You're going to be able to compromise the funding by practice and solution and try to show your concerns of why something is urgent and right. One of the examples for this is exactly the med, uh, policies regarding Medicare and education, right? These are the very bipartisan policies that often are able to engage with uh, various different uh, differences of people, right? But third of all, about check and balance. This we think that this is going to be very uh, this is going to be very difficult on their side. Because understanding that people have very uh, different ideology and spectrum that they try to prioritize, you won't be able to engage towards each other or try to criticize each other as much as they want to. Why? Because Criticizing each other is going to be normalized as a nuisance, right? They're going to notice that most of the criticisms that you're going to have is something that has been going on anyway. So even if you do have an urgent need that you need to voice out towards these people, they're not going to regard as something that is they should be prioritizing. They're just going to regard this as a way for you to try to trample them towards a certain candidacy or pol uh, political competition or whatsoever. Or whatsoever, right? So the trigger is simple. We understand that sometimes the minorities' needs are not going to be able to be catered to an extreme scenario. But at least they're not going to be constantly attacked, and at least they're going to have the basic rights to be able to begin with. With all that, we are proud to propose. Thank you, Tendo, for position. Now we please have the government whip to summarize the issues government. Joe, no. Exactly happening in the status quo. I don't think 
In our paradigm, we can envision a new world in which people have this presumption of absolutism. That is to say, only some opinions might be correct, only someone's interests might be correct, which allow people to justify their interests. Right? It's not like you know, only anger is something you have to use under our paradigm. Obviously, that's not the well, Of course, we can see open that we can use anger too. That's not it's more than that, right? You have to justify your anger to other people, to show to other people why your interests are far more important and justifiable to other people. And of course, politicians and people to engage in equal debate, showing statistics, showing, for example, documentary of how sexual assault is such a horrific issue, for example, right? Yes, we told you that you know, white people are probably racist, stick to their opinion, but always engaging with this objective information of emotional appeal in a documentary can change your opinion under our paradigm. And that's why that people can, you know, now admit that probably that my opinion or interest was illegitimate. And that's preferable world to restore our society, to decentralize the power, and that's what we told you in the extension. Two points. First of all, what does politics of reconstruction get in our paradigm? Second of all, what does politics of classical get actually mean in our paradigm? First of all, politics of reconstruction. First, I want to take our CEO a principle that, you know, policy you don't, should not be exclusionary. First of all, when people have been developing knowledge that policy, you know, we're okay with that exclusion, right? As long as that didn't take the mandate to keep policies, you gain the mandate to the government. Second of all, I think class is, you know, cross cutting category, right? When we're talking about, you know, middle class individuals, that also, I don't know, 60% of individuals are individual in our society, for example. What about gender, for example, right? That's, you know, 50% of our population. So I don't see how our policy is going to be exclusionary under our paradigm. So that brings me out. So, first of all, so, all case is that, you know, there's an asymmetry of power, white people have more privileges, so as a minority of people who want to have opinion, they have to compromise, they have to persuade other side of the house. I think that doesn't work for a number of reasons. First of all, but before that, actually we never know, there's no reason to provide options as to why the majority want to compromise now and accept more immigrants for their own opinion, right? There are a number of reasons why that characterization, or why that scenario is likely. First, we uniquely talk to propose the government. There's a lack of experiences or shared experiences of oppressions and discrimination. We are fighting to who we don't understand how even my profession can hurt the feeling of African American. Second of all, people have general entitlement to their own opinion. But furthermore, what makes things worse here is that exactly the politics of reconciliation. Because this normal way of predating our society that says all people are well-meaning, all people think they might be legitimate, and that we entrust in the minds of white people and majority people at the same time. What, what does that mean? Which means that these individuals have now defaulted the, the position that they think that their opinion is correct, right? You now think they are well-meaning individuals who now can justifiably you know, say racist things to other people, like Donald Trump right now, right? Which means that exactly the polarization is happening. These Republicans believe that you know, already our opinions must be correct. I have never understanding of other people's opinion, and that's happened on their side of the house. But second of all, I think this principle of you know, political relativism is asymmetrically applied in the status quo. What does that mean? Which means that, for example, at the point, you know, there are some white people who say racist thing, exclusionary thing, that person will get the bailing of the we well being people, a justification for their ident identity. Whereas at the point minorities say something to you know it hold out positions for you know their misbehavior or racist remark, now these minorities are condoned by this you know principle of reconciliation. That's to say, you know, they're not you're not just expecting the other people's feeling you have to be polite, you have to be respectful to the other side. So exactly that power structure is entrenched by the by the process of reconciliation, which now creates a sense of relativism and create entitlement for the old people to be in, and that also polarizes the discourse that the value that we should option when it's all about in this debate. So in that context, never or ever that compromises happens. Even that happens, that extremely small number of rates. But furthermore, even minority then still have to make compromises, right? What happened in 2016 was that you know many poor working class individuals had to vote for Trump under the illusion that Trump is going to create some good policies for them. Actually, you know, truth down theory has been proven to be a lie, right? Probably the world our paradigm that we better off at point again truly believe that my interest will be only in making some individuals are wrong and Perry will be the one who can vote for and that will change other our paradigm. Also, this is research is important. We spoke about the whole value of what happens in the ocean paradigm. You know, also they talk about getting the polarization, so this is important. But second, what will be politics of class warfare, right? So, opening the government's case and opening ocean cases like this. OG, you know, anger to mobilize more people and that's going to create some kind of, you know, more opposition of voters. Whereas opening should present that, you know, but they're radical, no compromising, so there is no support for majority. I have many points to point out. First of all, that characterization is false. We still asserted that these people are angry, no compromises. Here comes the real characterization for first government. As we have pushed consistently, you have to justify your interest, right? And also you have to pass a bill, which means that, you know, pragmatically speaking, for political expediency, you have to compromise to a certain extent in parties in both parties, we're perfectly okay with that. So it's not, you know, no change happens, change can happen. Second of all, I think also this benefits a lot of individuals and mobilizes a lot of individuals, right? It's not only about small percentage 
of population is a cross tapping category. It's forty percent. Thirty percent of population is a huge chunk of voters, which all poli all political positions, like all political spectrum, have to cater to in order for them to win the next election. But furthermore, we cost you more than that, right? We only got about eight for us, you know, numbers be increased. The question that opens side up here is that well will that not be accepted or be persuaded, consent conceded by the jury, right? Here comes our extension. First we told you that this could be real instead for people to check their, their opinion, right? It's our our primary opinion, opinion, the perception that some of his opinion is wrong, that have to engage in a political debate. We have several bases who stick to their opinion to some extent, but the broad chief here is a moderate right to individuals' opinions. We have to have engaged in a politics and in today, they have to now check whether their opinion is correct or not. They will present a lot of information, statistic and emotional appeal as well, and that really changes. But also we don't have to consent the first wave majority at point we can you know, use numbers and force them to compromise in the political sphere. And I think this is a better world. We tell you the questions of angle versus logic from all relatives and versus absolute sense, perhaps never being sexually proud of the motion.
that policy changes in the uh, policy changes can only happen if you have a sense of empathy so you can garner support from the society and when those policy changes can be long term in the end of the day. Because we realize that these changes are really important. Because the only way we can create these sorts of changes is when we are able to show to the government uh, the parliament for example or to the people in general that these changes are important and these changes are urgent. This can only happen if you are able to garner more support, if you are able to show to, uh, to these people that there are a lot of people fighting for and a lot of people demanding for those changes, right? If the, with that being said, the tipping point of this uh, clash should be which side can provide the likelihood of analysis as to why these things are possible in the end of the day. Realize that the uh, side of Ramadan's argument is clearly pro problematic and we don't think changes can happen on their side anyway. Because they never really pro pro provide you a likelihood of analysis as to why those things can happen, but their analysis totally realized in the world of a uh, uh, can only be operationalized if we live in a world that is currently in a vacuum where you only have one sort of ideology for example or you you don't have people retaliating to your really radical ideas to, uh, that you are trying to attack to people we don't think that the world that we are living in is currently like that but let's just try to engage on their side right mm. no thank you but um, the portrayal of their issue is two things, that we need to be as radical as possible and there should be a attack to villainize figures and idealism. In terms of radical, right, we say that this is problematic because realize that these ideas are not palatable for everyone. And not to mention because these ideas are not palatable, most likely it can be easily misconstrued by other people, that, that by the people that you deem as enemies. That's why when AOC is trying to talk about the Green New Deal that talks about climate change and inequality, the Republicans, which is her so, uh, enemies, for example, tries to frame it as a way of, you know, the Democrats are trying to take away your privacy rights and so on and so forth. So we don't so we don't think right it's uh, we don't think it's able to uh, exactly if people are so unable to change uh, are unable, uh, unable to change just like what CJ is trying to told you most likely they're just going to defend their ideas even more and they're not going to like willing to listen to the other side. Com uh, and second of all in terms of villainizing figures and idealism when you downplay uh, the grievances of other people, like you say Republicans is evil and you have no common ground, most likely it's going to add more fuel to the fire, meaning they're going to galvanize and retaliate even more to you in Why? the end of the day. This that polarization is going to happen worse on uh, on their side of the house, right? No, thank you. This is why Madeline's argument, member, uh, member of opposition's argument, is really important. If you are able to portray a the politics of reconciliation is generally when you are able to portray yourself as a politician that are able to listen and able to bridge one differences to one another. As a, uh, as a movement, when you use the politics of reconciliation, you are able to show yourself as a movement that are able to make strategic decisions. The sure, we, uh, we take the trade-off by saying that the benefit or the policies that might accrue on our side is not something that is as radical as they are trying to portray to you, but at least on our side, when we emphasize on commonalities and we are willing to listen to one another, at least we can find common ground so that other so that the other side will not suddenly attack us and say that our issues are invalid. Because we think that those things has, has been currently happening for a long time in our status so we think it's not productive anymore, it's no longer productive to actually continuously do that, uh, continuously do that. But second of all, in terms of long-term changes, we say that in terms of long-term changes, it's also never going to happen on their side. Because realize that they're, uh, what they're fighting for is also not something that is long term. Because you realize that class warfare mostly is just riding on what is currently trending in the status quo. You used to attack by in the in the era where LGBT community are not accepted, but right now fighting against the one percent or fighting against capitalism is the catchy go is the catchy jargon. Uh, is the catchy garden jargon, for example. So we say it's it's most likely it's going to change from one uh, issue to one another. It's not sustainable, and you have to do like a lot of resource uh, resource planning in order for you to keep yourself uh, keep yourself relevant. But we also say that those kinds of fights those kinds of fights are going to only happen in your echo chamber anyway, which is problematic for all of those reasons. Side side with closing opposition. Thank you.